In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praznikam! Praznikam! We celebrate today the Holy Archangel Michael and the synaxis of the Holy Bodiless Powers of Heaven. Does anybody know why we celebrate this today in the month of November? Anybody know? Anybody have a guess? It is because the calendar, the, the, beginning, of the, church, the beginning of the calendar used to be March, and so <clears throat> November would have been the ninth month. And since there are nine ranks of angels, the fathers chose for it to be the ninth month. And you know why we celebrate on the church calendar today is the eighth. Does anybody know why we celebrate it on the eighth day of the month? Because the eighth day represents the age to come, right? The eighth day is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his holy, heavenly, bodiless powers. It's quite interesting, isn't it? All these little things, there's always some kind of theology woven into every aspect of our church life. Often, you know, we see nines and threes and twos. This is obviously, you know, not numerology, but this is the symbology the representation that we see. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the primary function of angels are? Anybody? Uh huh. What's the other word? There's two words. They are <coughs> ministers, messengers. Looking for one word in particular. They are servants. Servants. They serve God. In fact, on the iconography on the doors, and you will often see in the iconography for angels that they will have a uh, kind of like a ribbon tied around their head, and it's kind of coming, it's flowing out behind them. You know, we often see this imagery in the icon, right, that there's action or that there's movement, or we talked a few weeks ago about how the icon looks out at the person. This imagery of the small bandana Somebody, I think it was somebody asked me about this many years ago or a couple years ago, and, and I eventually contacted and found uh, this iconographer that I knew, and he said it's because they're always swift, they're always running to do the will of God. So their ministry of being messengers, all of these things, are that they are servants of God. This is the primary purpose of the life of the angels. In fact, the angels were created in part or one of their aspects of their, of their, you could say, of their calling, or I don't know how you would really describe it, but part of their personhood, their being, is that they were, they were called to serve mankind. In fact, the tradition of the church is that <clears throat> the reason that the devil fell was because God commanded him to serve mankind. And the devil refused this. He felt that mankind was lower than the angels when in fact that was incorrect. Mankind was, uh, angels are, are bodiless, they're immaterial, whereas mankind is both soul and body. In fact, we know in the Garden of Eden, man was more, you could say, more spiritual than physical, although, you know, what exactly that means, you know, it's kind of hard to define. We know that when man was clothed in the garments of skin, when he fell, that garment of skin, according to the Holy Fathers, is our very flesh, our skin that we have now. That prior to this, man was not this physical, or in this way physical. But it was always God's intention that the second person of the triune Godhead, Jesus Christ, would become a man, and that man would become deified like God. This is kind of the unique property of mankind, right? There are no angels who can consecrate the gifts at the divine liturgy. It's an impossibility. Angels cannot do this. Angels also do not receive Holy Communion. They do not have... God dwelling in them to the same way that a person does, although we as people are often enamored by the angels. The angels, when they see a godly person, they are, in fact, you could say, uh, enamored by them because they have reached such a state 
They have become so deified, so godlike. It's, it, it's an incredible, incredible mystery. But I want to focus on one aspect of the angels, that they are the servants of God. And there's two aspects to this. One is that they are continually and perpetually running towards doing the will of God. And number two, that they subsist on the glory of God. This is the theology from the Holy Fathers, which is that the angels are literally sustained and carried along by the nourishment of being close to God and His glory. The glory of God nourishes the angels. It's probably in part why they are so beautiful, right? This nourishment and this servitude are, you could say, two highlights of the life of the angels which we are called to emulate. You know, it's quite interesting because people often see their lives. We are all tempted to this, obviously myself included. We are all tempted to see ourselves and our lives in kind of a self-referential manner, meaning we constantly are thinking about what is good for me. Am I being taken care of? Am I being, you know, uh, am, am, I, am I taking care of my own self? Are people neglecting me? Are my needs being missed? This is often, you know, a conversation in marriage, right? Especially when you have a heavy workload, which is both husband and wife, right? Feel tired and exhausted and all these different things. And they constantly are asking each other, hey, am I getting my needs met? Am I being taken care of? It's interesting because we find, we find in the Holy Scriptures, whether it be with the mother of God or St. Paul on his journeys, the apostles in their martyrdom, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that there is forever this dual aspect of being a Christian. Number one, that the life of a Christian is one of servitude. It is not about us. It is not about us finding our fulfillment in life. You know, people often say, oh, I want to find what my calling is or what my purpose is or I want to find my vocation and all these different things. And a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times people think about this in a very self-referential, you could almost say narcissistic way where they are consumed by the idea that they are going to find something to do that is somehow going to mystically fulfill and satisfy them and quite frankly brothers and sisters we may find a job that we like doing there may be things that we enjoy about life but nothing really fulfills us like the presence of God in our souls this is what we were created for in fact when we have the grace of God dwelling in us what we're doing in our day-to-day -day life becomes very secondary it loses a lot of its importance. And the second part is, we, like the angels, must subsist on the glory of God. We need to be nourished by God in order to carry out this work of a servant. You know, we've talked about this in previous homilies as one of the... One of the what do you want to say, highlights, something that's often focused in the gospel, which is that Christ withdrew to quiet places to pray. This is not because Christ, being fully God and fully man, needed quiet places. In fact, it's the converse. The Holy Fathers tell us that it is that Christ was modeling for us the way in which we needed to emulate him. We, brothers and sisters, need to find the quiet place and the quiet times in order to pray, to nourish and refresh our souls so that we can come in contact with this grace of God, this, this immaterial light, the presence of God. And the Holy Fathers tell us what the best time to pray is. Does anybody know what the best time to pray is? Huh? Yeah. The fathers tell us even in the middle of the night, they say, is the best time to pray. They say the whole world is asleep and the heavens are open. 
That is the language that they use. The, the whole world is asleep and the heavens are open. This is why many times as a pious practice, a lot of Christians will set their, you know, will set their alarm and they'll wake up in the night in order even just to pray for 10 or 15 or 30 minutes to say the Jesus prayer, something that's very easy on their mind and not taxing, so that they can have this sense of the presence of God. In fact, there's a beautiful story. I believe that it's uh, Elder Ephraim of Vatopedi who spoke about the fact, I, I believe it's, it may, may have been a different Athenite father now that I think about it, but he said the whole reason that he was attracted to the monastic life is because his grandmother came to live with them in Greece and they had such a small house that he had to live in the attic with his grandmother, but that in the middle of the night, his grandmother would wake up, she would light the candle, and she would begin to do prostrations and praying. And he saw this representation of, of well, what you want to say, true, true living, true humanness. You know, I believe there was also, I believe it's St. Yaakovos, uh, the modern day St. Yaakovos, who said that his mother would pray, I think similar to this, and that he saw her one time bathed in the uncreated light. And we know from the witness of uh, Elder Ephraim of Arizona that he and his mother and one of her close friends, he said, would oftentimes get up or be in the kitchen in the middle of the night doing prostrations and praying. It's a normal attitude. Now, we may not be able to do that for a variety of reasons, but it's actually one of the benefits of, of, of motherhood and of nursing, that a mother gets to spend a lot of time nursing her child and nursing her child even in the middle of the night, which is not supposed to be a chore, but it's supposed to be a spiritual offering to God. And there's no differentiation in this way, right? There's, there's no differentiation in God. St. Paisios, he says, the mother who gets up with her child in the middle of the night when she does this with a good attitude receives the same grace from God that the monks on Mount Athos receive when they're doing an all-night vigil in the church. Unless we be discouraged, I believe it was one of the modern elders who said something along the lines of, a hundred Jesus prayers on Mount Athos is equal to one Jesus prayer in the world. So if we think, oh, Lord have mercy, I can't do 3,000, 10,000 Jesus prayers like they do on Mount Athos, the mathematics are different in the eyes of God. Even if we just sit at night when it's dark and the children have gone to bed, even if we're unable to wake up or do all those things, but before we rest our head on our pillow, we simply just turn out the lights, we sit down and begin to say the Jesus prayer, there is a lot of grace that comes from this. Saint Ephraim of Katanakia, the modern day saint who was known as Papa Ephraim, he's the disciple of Saint Joseph the Hezekast, he said he used to encourage people, just 30 minutes, just 30 minutes in the evening of the Jesus prayer works wonders. It's not the Jesus prayer in and of itself, the fathers tell us, but it's the name of Jesus Christ which scrubs the inside of us. The name of Jesus Christ has so much power that the devil cannot be around when this name is being uttered. It purifies us, it cleanses us, it brings us in contact with this grace. You know, my spiritual mother, she was often fond of telling me, burn out, Burnout is a sign of a lack of reliance upon God. When we feel burned out, when we feel tired and exhausted and feel like we cannot go on, this is a sign that we are not receiving our spiritual nourishment. We are not receiving enough grace from God. Because when man has this grace of the Holy Spirit, living and dwelling within him, it nourishes him to the utmost. It does not matter the circumstances of life. And I think I mentioned this before, but St. Nicholas, uh, St. Nikolai Veremirovich, the modern day Serbian saint, was in uh, the Nazi concentration camp of Dachau. Terrible atrocities went on there. And yet later on in his life, when people would talk to him about this, he said, 
I would give up everything right now to go back and be in Dachau for even five minutes. He said, when I was in Dachau, he says, I could so acutely feel the presence of God. This is what we need in life. You know, so often we say, oh, I need this. I need a new phone. I need a new job. You know, I, some, you know, these different temptations that assail us. I need new things. I need new people in my life when the reality is I really need the Holy Spirit. And I don't have enough of him in my life, enough of him in my soul. All of our struggles can be summarized by this fact. All of them. I should say almost all of them, but I cannot almost think of a single struggle in our life that cannot be overcome or mitigated by the presence of the Holy Spirit. What we need is the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and nourishing us for the work, for the labor, for the servitude that God would have us do to our family and to our fellow man. This is in imitation of God, and the angels are in, intimita- in, are in imitation of God, and we are imitating God, we are imitating the angels, we are imitating the mother of God and the saints. When we are a servant, when we lower ourselves and we take care of those around us. When we take care of those, the poor and the needy in society. When we take care of children, when we pour out our life in this manner. May we be reminded of this reality of the angels that all of their servitude is dependent upon the nourishment of the glory of God that they constantly partake in. And may we seek after the same nourishment of God's glory. May we not seek the nourishment of this world, but the nourishment of God himself, which is found primarily through prayer. If we commit ourselves in this way to much prayer and fasting, we will find the grace of God strengthening us for the difficulties in our life that all of us face. And we will be able to live our life in a godly manner united to our Lord Jesus Christ. All that we do is a preparation for the age to come where we will more fully be immersed in this grace, in this glory, and we will become fully who it is that God intends us to be. May God strengthen you this week. May we all be encouraged to pray, to pray more fervently, and to set apart the quiet times in order to fill our souls with the presence of God, which is what he desires for our life. To him be all glory, honor, and worship, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.